Hi everyone, it's Grant Abbott here and also got my great friend Tim Munro. How are you going, Tim? I'm good, Grant. How are you? It's good to be back with you again. Yeah, sorry, I haven't got your lovely dial on the uh, up on the screen. There's obviously something going wrong with uh, COVID, but no doubt you've got a you've got a couple of big sessions uh, coming up. Uh, do you want to uh, just do a bit of a publicity for them? Uh, look, that's very kind. Yes, we've got um, a big session on COVID again on Monday, um, where we're going to, I think we're talking different things today, but on Monday we'll be going through some new updates we've got from Change GPS. So a free email for all attendees, if in, even if you're not a GPS user, to help position your work for JobKeeper version two with your clients and how to charge. And then of course for GPS core members, a whole swag of new updates that you get as part of your subscription uh, to keep track of it. And look, there's some big danger points. I'm gonna talk about those today, but we've got some practical tools, which I'm finalizing over the weekend that you'll have access to next week. And then look, next Friday, Activate Change 2021, a special full day um, virtual conference for accounting business owners. David Boyd and myself will be running that. Grant, you're going to be doing a special session on that yeah, and part of the, the panel at the end of the day, which should be fantastic again to have no, you there. With, with a glass of wine, it'll be, it'll be beautiful. I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it, as is usual. So, um, I know, and, and that's funny, actually, because I uh, took my first plane trip today. Um, I've come down to see Mum and also Dad down here in Adelaide. And it's, uh, mm. quite, a, it's quite amazing the, um, to actually go on a plane. It's almost like a an ethereal experience because there's virtually no one around. I went to go to the uh, Qantas lounge and of course that was uh, closed in Brisbane until seven. I, I instead of flying out the Sunshine Coast, I had to go to Brisbane. But it was a it was a unique experience. Um, and then I had to go mm. through a, it would have been about 40 police. Um, you have to obviously go through almost border patrol. And uh, so it's a completely different experience. But um, look, we're, we're right in that middle of uh, COVID-19. Um, shout out to all our Victorian friends. You know, I feel really bad for you. I know I've got Tony Anamoulis, who's my partner at Abbott Morley. I've got my daughters down there. And, you know, just a sad state. And look, at, look I, I'm not sure. Um, and look, I'm not an epidemiologist, but it seems everywhere in the world that no one's been able to escape at some point in time. They can get locked down, but at some point in time just tends to drift in. It's obviously coronavirus is the same uh, sort of, uh, same sort of virus as a cold or it's a, it's a cousin of the cold and uh, also mm -hmm. SARS and they've never got a vaccine for those ones. So I think we're just going to have to live with it. But uh, I uh, spent uh, last night looking through the economic and fiscal update and it scared the bejesus out of me. Sorry to to um to be profane there uh but this was given yesterday hasn't really got a huge amount of um publicity but i pulled out these couple of nuggets out of there uh straight out of the treasury statement which goes for about 160 pages we've got there uncertainty surrounding the covid pandemic uh and the global recession may dampen economic sentiment more than expected leading to weaker than expected global economic activity which we've seen already this will threaten recovery even in individual economies that do succeed in normalising domestic activity. These uncertainties may also play out in financial markets through investor confidence. The current financial market optimism around the evolution of the global economy presents some risk of, of another correction should investor risks perceptions deteriorate. The extent of any longer lasting effects from the pandemic is also uncertain, including as a result of persistently high unemployment, business failures or broader changes to the structure of the economy, both domestically and globally. This economic scarring may suppress the pace of recovery. Going to put it on you, Tim. How long do you think we're going to be living with the economic impact of this? Look, everything is a guess right now. Um, it's going to be a long time. Um, and that's why I've got some, I suppose, disturbing things I want to bring up and talk about later. But in a, in a positive way, like we're all for practical positivity. We've got to help our clients. We've got to get through it ourselves. So there's no point thinking, hey, it's, it's so bad, it's so bad, there's nothing we can do. But there is some reality checks that we need to take for our businesses and we need to do for our clients. Because, um, look, if there's not a vaccine and if there's not a way that we can get economic um, you know, stimulus moving and cash moving, things are just going to 
tighten up more and more. And, and then I think we'll start to see, um, you know, people getting frustrated in their lives. And that's why we've got all these, you know, Black Lives Matters um, demonstrations taking place everywhere. And is it really about Black Lives Matters? Or is it people just getting out there and being activists and doing Now, I don't want to get into politics here, because that's not my thing. But, um, you know, we we can start to see society start to break down in certain ways. And that's a bit of a scary thing. We just don't know what this is, what's going to happen. So I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. I'm trying to be, you know, looking at reality, but then how can we help our clients and ourselves to take positive steps to protect ourselves and move forward? I think it's a, it's really important. There are a couple of issues. Uh, first off is that uh, this is not, unlike the GFC, which only hit a few, um, a uh, few countries, this has hit everyone. So no one, no one's escaped. And even though New Zealand, a lot of the Pacific countries have escaped it, all I think is you just, uh, much the same as we're up in Queensland or in Adelaide, you might have escaped it, but at some point in time, it's going to bleed in. You can't lock your borders forever. It's just an impossibility. And you can see that um, in New South Wales, the big spike up, what was that from? The Diamond Princess. Um, and yeah. then the other one was uh, in Melbourne was returning travellers. So it's sort of the, one of those ones that it is as virulent as the cold. So at some point in time, it's just going to keep on going. Whether you can get a vaccine or not, who knows, is going to be a issue in itself. Um, the other one is it has had such a huge impact. Uh, in Australia, we're up at, if you have a look at our unemployment rate here, it's expected to top out around about eight and three quarters in 2021, if you see over the right hand side. But if you look at um, the US, they're up around about 20% because obviously they have a lot of people in the service industries. And that means it's a huge chunk of change coming out of the, the, the GDP, which is quite, uh, quite interesting from that perspective. So look, when, when we go down, it, you know, this is again, I've taken a nugget out of the economic outlook. It says a fallen global economic activity, this magnitude has not been seen since the Great Depression in the 1930s. I was listening to a podcast uh, just a second ago, which is quite interesting that um, everyone else, uh, including obviously Japan, and this is great, this uh, economic outlook, because it looks at every one of our major trading partners. Obviously, they're trying to make a prediction, but everyone has put so much liquidity into the market. But you know, there's one country that hasn't, hasn't put any liquidity in it. Do you know who that is, Tim? I don't, but I'm interested to find out, Grant. China. China. I was going to guess China. Yeah. It's strange. That, well, you know what they were like in the GFC. They pumped so much liquidity into the marketplace and this time they haven't put anything in. So I'm sure there's a lot of wiser heads out there that know a little bit more than that. So, Grant, have you, is, is, is this leading into some sort of, I'm not going to use the words conspiracy theory, but there's lots of theories about, you know, why things have gone on. That's really interesting, isn't it? Just China. Well, it is because they're, they're not, well, you know, in the last few years, when the market goes down, what do they do? They pump up the, the uh, monetary volume. And it's really strange that um, the, you know, the POBC hasn't put a dollar extra into the marketplace, which is, wow. it's just, it's just I, I don't know. And they're also at the same time, they're testing their digital one. So it's interesting. Um, now, I've pulled up here, before we start getting into Tim's stuff, um, also... Uh, these are the figures from the uh, 2021 that they're expecting of their revenue. And you can see their total receipts are dropping from 469 um, billion down to 500, uh, 455 billion. Um, I'm not sure about that. I mean, what what say you, Tim? You're a pretty wise sort of character. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, I'm looking at, at 2020 and 2021, and I'm just shaking my head and I can't see how how there's only such minor drops they're, they're you know they're expecting like a four to five percent increase in gdp over the next couple of quarters i uh, look uh, again i i i can't see how they've got to these figures number one um look i think we're all a bit sus on treasuries figures to go right from 130 bill down to 70 or whatever like is they, they tend to get things wrong all the time. Interesting, super fund taxes are the only things going up here. <laughs> no. Quite interesting. Um, well, it is like to hear your thoughts on that. But the, the rest of it, we, we're seeing, and I'll, I'll come to this in a minute, we're, we're seeing there are three types of clients. Um, clients that are doing very well, clients that are doing break-even, just hang on, 
and clients that really shouldn't be in business. And yeah. across the board, um, while taxes will come down because there's not as much money being made, things like, look, JobKeeper have artificially stimulated things. And so we've got, you know, all these kids that were, you know, casuals on 1500 bucks a fortnight. They've got money to spend. They mightn't have spent it yet, but they will start to spend. Um, so I'm in two minds. Like there's still the same amount of money that's flowing around. Yeah, people are knocking down debt and all the rest of it. They're not spending money in overseas holidays, but people are buying cars. People are doing a lot of work on their houses. Uh, people are buying a lot of online shopping. I mean, goodness yeah. me, the number of parcels coming through everywhere. So, yeah. look, it, money is still being spent, but it's being spent differently. So yeah. that's why it's really hard to tell what the tax take is going to be. Yeah, it's quite amazing. I know there's a couple of um, uh, online uh, clothing industries that work um, throughout the, you know, obviously they're based in Australia, but one was on the Gold Coast, one's up the Sunshine Coast. But these guys are uh, turning over up to, you know, three or four million dollars per month in sales. And it's just mm. it's quite amazing sort of stuff. And most of it comes from China. So, yeah, look, it's an unbelievable situation. But the government seems to have, you know, primed itself and again pray for the best prepare for the worst and i think that's absolutely crucial and uh, with this day i mean after uh, covid came in i think we all have to expect the un unexpected do you want to take us through all the all the changes um and what you see yeah sure look i'm going to really gloss through this slide and talk about um dangers and opportunities potentially for accountants because it's just things that i've been doing a lot of reading on and seeing what people are talking about. And I've got a lot more thinking to do about this over the weekend. Because as you know, I'm, I'm a big systems guy. How can we make things simpler for mums and dads to understand? And then as an accountant out there, how can we de-risk our business? So obviously the key thing is that JobKeeper payments are going to be significantly reduced. Um, for uh, full-timers down to 1,200 per fortnight from 28th of September to the 3rd of January, and then a thousand a fortnight from 4th of January to the 28th of March. So our clients are going to have to be, we're going to need to help them with their payroll to get that right. And then for casuals or for people working less than 20 hours a week, down to 7.50 a fortnight um, from 28th of September to 3rd of January, and then down to 6.50 a fortnight from 4th of January to 28th of March. Um, we've obviously got reductions in job seeker, and I've also seen that to keep getting the job seeker, you've got to uh, people have got to actively be looking for work and can't turn down jobs. And that's been one of the big problems we've seen that, you know, people have just been willing to sit back and say, stuff it, I, I'm better off staying at home. There's no incentive to get out there and work. So I know the government had to move fast early on, but now they've had a bit more time to think about it. So I'm happy to see these reductions in JobKeeper and JobSeeker, but I've got a qualification now I'll come back to. Um, we've obviously got the cash flow boost for employers. So we've got the second part of that happening now between now and the end of uh, September. And then obviously we've got the unsecured loans from um, you know, the government so securing those up to a million dollars to 30th of June, 2021. I think that's a big fur for the unsecured loans. Like it's great, there's gonna be, but they've got to be paid back sometime. Um, and that's the big thing that we'll be talking about on Monday. Actually, David Boyle will be doing some actual cash flow forecasting to, to look at this because it's, it's great that we've got these support here, but it, things will have to be paid back. And so you know, just to talk about where I see the, the big issues we've got, clients that are doing well, they, they're not going to be on JobKeeper. And by the way, the big change with JobKeeper is we're looking at things quarterly. So instead of looking at projected turnover, we're looking at actual GST turnover. And to, to get JobKeeper uh, from end, 1st of October to the end of you know, December, effectively, we need to have a 30%, assuming we're talking about our normal clients, 30% you know, fall in turnover in both the June and September quarters compared to 2019. And the ATO have some alternative tests that we can look at. We won't go through any of those today, but we've got to have quarterly turnover, two lots of quarterly turnovers. Then when it gets to our job keeper from you know, January, February, March, we've got three lots of quarterly turnover, June, September, December. So I think that probably a lot of our clients that are in job keeper will not be eligible. Yeah. Accountants, yeah. if you think you're going to have a holiday in, in December, January, early January, <laughs> not. 
because we're going to have to be looking at our December fall of turnover. Will it be enough? And then get some payments happening to, you know, to uh, employees of clients in early January so they can continue getting JobKeeper. It's going to be a nightmare. Uh, so we're developing some systems. The first lot of those will release on Monday. More will be released a bit later. At least we don't have a super time rush because we've got time to plan for this now. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of work for accountants coming up. Obviously, make certain that you charge properly for that. Um, on Monday, we're going to release a free email to go out to your clients. Uh, and Grant, we'll, make, we'll give that to you to send that to everyone that's here today and everyone on your database as well. Um, so we're releasing a JobKeeper 2 version. Of, of all of our docs, but we'll give a free email where you can actually explain what you need to do as an accountant and what your prices are going to be. Uh, because you've got a lot of work coming up to get it right. Now, two big issues we found. One is JobKeeper audits are starting. And on our Chain GPS Facebook site, one of our members just posted one of their clients has failed a JobKeeper audit because they weren't, their client should have been doing things and the accountant was telling the client what to do and they weren't making their STP payments and reporting on time. They gave things to the ATO um, that weren't signed off on the required dates. And basically, the ATO is saying, right, you've got to pay back, you know, I think it was 30 grand of the JobKeeper payments. Mm -hmm. um, accountants, we need to reduce the risk. We need to de-risk our businesses. So if, if clients are taking on certain responsibilities, make certain that scope is very clear. If you're checking, make certain that you know, you're charging properly for it and you've got a proper system. And we'll show you the systems on Monday that you can use. The other thing which is the big risk, and Grant, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Like we've said, one group of clients are doing very well. One group of clients are hanging in there. Job keepers keeping them there, but then they're gonna get through it. One group of clients should not be in business. And it's, I think it's, if accountants don't give clients those hard, um, I suppose, discussions right now, it's just not going to work out well. The, account, the client will blame you as the accountant for not giving them the proper advice. And, and just watch out because if, 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 a lot of clients are wanting stuff for free. A lot of accounts are giving away work for free, which I think is just ridiculous. But if you're not giving your clients the advice, hey, listen, it's not going to, we don't think you're going to survive post job keeper. Do something about it now. Don't get further in debt. Don't get further behind. The clients will blame you, or we're going to get an insolvency lawyer or some other lawyer say, hey, listen, your accountant should have done this. You know, your account's going to be responsible. So make certain that you, do a quick cash flow forecast and we'll show you how to do that on Monday. Show you how to do something that only takes you 10 minutes. Run through the figures with your clients. Give the hard advice to your clients. Um, and at Change GPS, we've got the system to allow you to do that, to help your client to say, right, let's just stop this. Let's just rip off the Band-Aid now. Let's appoint an administrator and let's try and do something different rather than flogging the dead horse. Um, a third of the businesses out there should not be in business. They're on life support with JobKeeper. And even though JobKeeper's going down, it's not gonna work out well. It's quite interesting because I was having a chat with um, Michael Jeffries, um, who's with uh, um, Optimum Ventum, who look at uh, a lot of that sort of stuff that, uh, you know, sorting out creditors. And they're saying that insolvencies in administration is way, way down compared to normal. and. Uh, whereas accounts are very, very, very busy. So it looks as though all this stimulus is keeping a lot afloat that shouldn't be afloat. Um, we've yeah. also got that break until, well, potentially up until the end of September where there's no uh, trading uh, insolvent uh, has been sort of put off the table. It's going to be interesting to see what happens after that. As you said, I, I think there will end up being mass liquidations uh, or mass administrations. I mean, you can just tell walking around walking around um, our area up in Sunshine Coast, every like fourth or fifth um, a business seems to have a lease, uh, you know, for lease on its door. Yeah, look, I think this is going to be massive. So the date, I believe, is 23rd of September yeah. that the uh, protection for everyone runs out. Now, I haven't seen that date extended in all these uh, documents. Yeah, um, I can look at everything and it's not in there. Presuming it's going to be a massive release or something. Um, I had a yeah. couple of questions here. I know you're a guru at all this sort of stuff. Uh, I've got from Darren Jennings. Um, he says, presumably, if you've not been down in turnover, 
in either of the June or September quarters, you're out of JobKeeper. Yeah, Darren, that's 100% correct. Um, even if you miss one, so the, the first thing is, to get the JobKeeper post in September, you need to be down in both June and September. So let's just say that June, you kind of picked up and your turn was okay, um, but then things, you know, smashed you if you're down in Melbourne and you've got to lock down again, well, you're out, um, you know. So if you're up, if you don't meet the 30% fall in June and in September, you're out of JobKeeper and that's it. Um, so very important for those calculations to be accurate and done, and that's based on actual GST turnover. So we, ATO is making it a bit easier. They'll be comparing what you lodge uh, compared with what you lodged in the last period of time, and it's going to be very simple to see if someone applies for JobKeeper or continues applying for it, and they shouldn't be receiving it. There's another question here from, I think it's Mariana. Um, simple BAS includes total turnover, including input tax supply, but GST turnover for JobKeeper doesn't include input tax supply. How will the ATO know if a business is eligible when they have both suppliers? Look, really good question. I don't have an answer for that at the well, moment. It's, like a, it's a very spocky question, but it's a great question. Yeah. Look, GST turnover, once again, it comes down to um, definitions with everything, and I've seen a lot of people talking about that again today. We'll, we're waiting for more information to come out post the you know the couple of pages that's already come, and then we'll be able to get into that, uh, answer that question. So hold on to that, and we'll, we'll get back about that. Okay, and I'm going to come back to you in a few uh, instances anyway, because I know a lot of the strategies that I'm going to go through, um, you're already doing. So um, again, a couple of little nuggets out of there. Uh, six member SMSFs um, I thought were actually going to be binned, uh, but effectively uh, they are now um, back on the table. Uh, the legislation is there uh, and it just needs to go through House of Reps, which it has. It has to go through the Senate, be reintroduced as a bill, um, and then it'll apply for the data royal assent. I can guarantee you 100% that this will happen before the next election because the government is taking aim um, at the industry superannuation funds. And it's quite funny here is also that they've changed the date from September, can you believe this? From September 2020 to 31st of December in order to access super. So mm. as that job keeper and that job seeker starts to wind down, I can tell you there's going to be a lot of people and you can already start to see it out on social media, people sniffing around and saying, well, I've used my money for this, so I've done it for this, or so I've paid down debt. Um, in fact, I saw a couple who are both uh, taken out their $20,000 each and they're using that as a deposit for their first home, which, you know, wow. you know, kudos to them. That's a great idea. But that's going to have a huge drain on resources. And look, I, I always said right at the start, that I saw this as a 60 to $70 billion drawdown scheme, which is obviously going to have a big impact on uh, industry funds. To date, uh, we had a chat with the Commissioner of Taxation, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, the Assistant Commissioner of Taxation, Steve Keating, and he was saying there's only been $258 million uh, has been taken out of the self-managed super fund market or self-managed super funds. So while one's going down, the other one is going up. So. Look, I, I, I'm not sure whether they meant it, but whoever came up with that idea is certainly, it's played into the hands of SMSFs uh, as opposed to industry superannuation funds, which were virtually running zero cash balances. The hubris at that time was, you know, obviously we can make a lot of money for our, our members by investing in private equity, et cetera. So accessing super, again... Hey, Grant, can I just ask about that? Now, I reckon that's fascinating play because... Once again, not trying to get political, but for years, everything's been done recently to kind of boost up the power of the industry funds. Yeah. This kind of was a very simple and easy, well, hey, um, I suppose the government taking the moral high ground, everyone needs a super great, make it available, uh, draining industry funds, industry funds having to obviously um, reduce assets at the time and values are going down. And we know all the classic industry fund valuation of non-liquid assets anyway. Are mm. you expecting to see some radically bad performance of industry funds post 30 June 2021? Yeah, definitely. Well, they've had to take a lot out of, obviously, out of the market, their fixed interest. Oh. 
But if you have a look at Host Plus, I mean, those guys were a lot of liquidity and most of them are also over in overseas stuff. I believe, mm. have a look at all the pundits and I might be, look, who knows? I, I don't know much about investment, but um, if you go back, a lot of people are saying this is hearkening back to the um, early stages of, you know, 1929, the early 30s when everyone was expecting that, oh, okay, well, it's fantastic, you know, we're going to get back, it's, you know, it's only going to be a short period of time and we'll all be back and everything is, is going to be hunky-dory. And I don't think that that's the case. If you have a look over in the US, most of the volume that's going through the uh, exchanges at the moment is from these Robin Hood traders. You know, people who are 18, 19, 20 are using credit cards to actually go on and day trade. And that smacks way back in 1999. So, you know, we, we just don't know what's going to happen on that other side. But mm. the good thing about it is, and, and this is what I like, SMSFs invest in Australia. And I think that that's the big area there for us. And uh, obviously, there's a huge exposure to industry funds for offshore, particularly in the US, etc. So it's going to be interesting to see what, what happens over there for those industry funds. But look, the government, you can see the government is gone, oh, this is, this is draining a little bit of liquidity out of the industry funds. So let's go from September to December. So I think it's a, it's a great move. And if you overlay that with six member super funds, you know, you're in a pretty good position to really change the shape. And I mean, the last time the, 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 the big change in shape for self-managed superannuation funds was in uh, 2006, 2007, when they had that transition. Remember, we we're having the non-concessional caps, but you could put in a, a, a million dollars for each member. And that virtually uh, saw SMSFs overtake uh, retail funds uh, over that period of time. So... Uh, look, fingers crossed. I think SMSF's in a good place, sort of. Um, look, a couple of things there is that uh, there's been a lot of hoo-ha from the lawyers. And I love that, you know, when the, the tax office comes out and talks about, obviously, rent relief and, and the lawyers talk about, well, it's gnarly, it's this and all that. And I we had we had a part of our, our virtual strategy summit. We sat down with uh, Steve Keating, went through, he said, look, we're actually issuing a guidance here, a guidance statement, you know, to really make sure that there's there's no dramas there. Because they're also talking about LRBA and NALI. And you know, he's very pragmatic. Um, what I will do as part of this session, uh, we are videoing this, so I'll send this out to you, but I'll also send a, a link to that session we did at the Virtual Strategy Summit, which is brilliant. And in fact, I think there's been about 10 articles over the last couple of weeks uh, from uh, in the trade dailies uh, as a consequence of that session. Because unlike uh, typical uh, tax office, you get them along and they just talk to a statement, uh, basically focus on compliance, we gave them a whole set of really pointed questions, which was uh, fantastic. So look, that rent relief, they got a bit of a compliance holiday up to 30 June 2021. Um, he explains all of that, so I won't need to go through that one. Deeming rates, uh, they, well, I shouldn't just say they slashed, uh, but the deeming rates in May, they dropped down to 2.25 from 2.75. Um, and they've reduced them now by another 25 basis points down to 2%. Uh, and that's wonderful considering most pensions are getting like 0.25. Hey, that's still oh, crazy. I know. that's, And we'll talk about that in a second. Pension drawdown, I've got here, um, Fund of 65 is now reduced to 2%. But as you get older, there's that 50% drawdown is... Um, you know, is there really at the end of the day, they should really say, you know, don't worry about it. And, and look, I, I think when we have a look at it, you know, it's getting to that stage, depending on what what aspect the client is in, if they're not earning any income at all inside the fund, is it worthwhile being in a pension anyway? Why not just keep it over in the accumulation side? Because it's not a bad idea if we believe coming down the track in the next 18 months or so, uh, even 12 months, that effectively there's going to be a reverse in the market or the market is going to drop. And again, I, I can't guarantee that. But if it is going to start to drop and people really say, well, hold on, this is not just a 12-month and 18-month thing. It's actually going to be a decade-long thing. Um, if you have a look at Newell Rubini, who's the economist who predicted, uh, predicted the um, last GFC, he says this is going to actually be a depression for the whole a decade. So I don't want to blow you out with that sort of stuff. But if we know that the market is going to come down at some point in time, it's not a bad idea to wheel back, stop the pension, throw it back into the accumulation side 
um, and that effectively will give you a T-bar credit of whatever you roll back. So for example, if we've got $3 million on the pension side because of the growth on the upside, if I take it back, then my T-bar is now 3 million, uh, not 1.6. So I'll be able to consolidate a lot when it comes back at a later stage. So it's gonna be interesting for that. And look, one of the, the big areas that a lot of uh, SMSF um, members and, and pension members and retirees have been relying on is obviously uh, they're heavily into banks um, and they're getting their dividends with franking credits. And you know, what do, what do you expect out of that for the next 12 months, uh, Tim? Look, it's gonna be it's gonna be tough. Like it's yeah, the bank divs with franking credits. Um, it just depends how much in way of, I suppose, defaults and everything else we're going to see, whether they've got to start making some high provisions and some of those you know, standard dividends are going to come down. Having said that, the, a lot of people have kind of reduced debt recently anyway. Mm. Um, so I, I don't think it's going to change too much over the next 12 to 24 months. But after that, it could be anyone's guess. I know there's going to be some sectors like uh, the commercial property market, I think is... Oh, to... that's, that's deadly. It was quite funny. There was uh, um, uh, one of the, the ones that came out, obviously, in Victoria is in a pretty tough lockdown there. Uh, but we did do a piece um, uh, in The Australian Lawyer. I know Tony and Amulis and I, we both work from home and you know we, we run a pretty successfully with Zoom. Uh, whereas a lot of uh, legal firms are so structured, they want their clients and they want their staff in there uh, at all points in uh, time. Uh, and I think it was Ebsworth ended up having coronavirus outbreak across all of their firm because they were forcing um, their lawyers to come into work, which also raises another issue from a litigation perspective is that if you're forcing your clients to come into work and they get coronavirus, you know, what's, what's the liability around that? I um, mean, you think as lawyers, they would have been a bit smarter than that. But anyway, <laughs> not, they're not all that smart. So commercial, I can see. Um, look, some of the, the stuff that we want to get into now is just a few little uh, strategies. Um, if there is spare cash, um, and look, the best time to ever make contributions is obviously right at this present point in time. July is the, the absolute cracker um, time to do in it. But again, this, is, this comes back to our... Uh, I suppose our accountants uh, working our budgets uh, for the year and what the expectations are. So do you do that uh, much, uh, Tim, sort of start at the year and work out, obviously you've got your, that awesome tax plan plus and your, that tax cash flow. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could, if you did that, you can virtually do your analysis uh, straight off the bat, can't you? Yeah, that's 100% it. Um, so with tax plan plus, what we're doing and what we're recommending GPS members now is use it for 2021. So we've got 2021 tax rates in there. You can model out company, trust, individual super funds right now. Model out the expected you know, profits, where money comes and goes. And then you can give your client an instant report in a couple of minutes with that. And that's great because it's all about helping your clients, your mums and dads to understand how they're taxed and in what entities and roughly when. Now what we're working on at the moment is to release in a couple of weeks time a second report, which is the tax flow report, and that's exactly what you spoke about. It'll show your expected PAYG instalments for twenty for the next twelve months in a in a cash flow format for every entity and every individual, plus um, any tax payment arrangements you're on with the ATO, plus any tax payments you know we expect for twenty twenty tax returns. So that way you can see, you can help your clients to understand for the next 12 months from a cash flow point of view, what their tax obligations are. So there's no confusion. And it's so important to get this done, I'd say in the next month or two, so they can understand it. And then if they say, no, that's too much, great. Well, we can vary PAYG, but don't forget PAYG isn't automatically zero for the September quarter. The ATA will go back to the normal PAYG calculations and then you'll have to vary it down. So again, you're going to have to have some basis on which to vary things down or to help your clients to understand why they're paying a certain amount. So yeah, this is something we do now. A lot of accountants leave tax planning till May and June every year. That's when you do your final tax planning. Accountants, you should, you, you should be doing a preliminary 2021 20, tax planning right now, you know, in the first quarter of this year. 
And I, I think one of the ones that I, I see that, as you said, we go through the three the three structures. So you've got the the clients who, particularly in the, oh gosh, you know, having a look around the airport and uh, tourism, not too bad, but. You know, if this starts to spread and gets locked down, it's going to be a um, pretty, pretty grim over the next six months in that area. So a lot of those businesses are going to go obviously out of out of whack. But then you've got the other guys at the top end um, who aren't doing really well. Um, uh, they are getting a lot of cash uh, into their business, um, but they just we're not hoarding it. I, I think it just starts to sit on their balance sheet. They don't know what to do with it. So there's no asset protection in there at all. I mean, one of the easiest ways to get asset protection, as long as you're not, you know, you're not doing it to defraud your creditors, the the clawback in relation to contributions uh, doesn't apply. So you can put whatever you want, and once it's inside that self-managed super fund. Um, effectively, it's protected uh, from your trustee and bankruptcy. Again, as long as you're not you're not insolvent at this present point in time, so it's not a bad idea as a, a structure anyway to go and put as much as you can uh, into super. But do you talk to your clients around asset protection if they are doing really well? Oh, 100 percent, Grant. Um, look for those who know me now and, and what I've and you've spoken about in the past. Um, asset protection is the cornerstone with everything you do. If you get proper asset protection, you actually, at the same time, get the most flexible tax outcomes for your clients. And so, look, I mean, again, everything you've got with like your docs, we're using your leading member and family protection trusts. Mm. And every client, okay, I've actually got, I'm looking at it right now, I've got nine sets to send back to the lawyers to do PPSR registrations and to do uh, second mortgages because. If you've got a company, for argument's sake, and doing quite well and the building up and retained profits are there, well, look, number one, hopefully the shareholder is a leading member discretionary trust. But number two, um, there's some value there in those shares. So, you know, what can we do? How can we, you know, extract that value? And it might be that we make, you know, whoever the shareholder is, if it's an individual, uh, for argument's sake, say, say you take on a client and they own shares in a company and um, you know, the company's done quite well. Well, that individual, provided they're not doing default credit to, to um, default creditors, could gift the equity across to a leading member trust or family protection trust. Um, and then that trust can take PPSR registration over those shares. So there's just a few different things that you can look at doing. Um, we don't like trading companies have hoarding cash. We're like, you know, paying the tax, get a dividend out and then loan the funds back in, once again, with PPSR registration from a holding company to a trading company. Um, look, th these asset protection things are vital. And I think in August, Grant, I'm gonna try and um, get you to do a couple of sessions with us on advanced estate planning and asset protection. And we'll go through a few case studies and how it all links together. Yeah, it was interesting. I was doing quite a um, uh, big session yesterday with a client who's in uh, probably about six, six jurisdictions and tax havens and a lot of that sort of stuff. And it's quite funny because they they didn't have any, they were coming back to Australia with in 10 years, so they wanted to buy a property here, so we put it into a family protection trust. Um, and I said, well, what's gonna happen with the distributions? And and I said, I oh, will take them back. And obviously they were non-resis. So when they go back, it's a flat rate of 29%. I said, well, it doesn't make any sense because if you parked it into a, um, a company, then effectively what you've got there, and you've just got to be careful again, make sure the company shares are owned by a discretionary trust or the family protection trust or whatever, mm -hmm. that effectively what will happen there is that um, you'll pay the tax about the same amount, but you've got a credit sitting in there for later on use uh, sitting in your company. So rather than just giving it straight to the tax office and losing that credit, um, that effectively you're better off are warehousing it inside that company, which seems to be a lot better way of doing it. And, and I'm sure a lot of people don't look at it in that in that shape or form. No, I agree with you. That's that's 100% the best way to do it. And I mean, then you, you come into things with at the moment, like bucket companies and other things like that. And I think a lot of accountants um, need to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Because if you've got, you know, mum and dad doing quite well on high tax rates, store the funds in a bucket company, pay your 27.5 or your 30 or the 26, whatever, you know, rate you can get it down to. Um, and then have it there ready to kind of pay out at a later date 
to your mum and dad when they're not working as much. Um, you can get, what, 180 each, you know, fully frank, you know, dividends, you know, total taxable income. There's no additional tax to pay. And you can do that for a number of years if you've got good retained profits in a company. I mean, why wouldn't you do that? Yeah, I, I know. It's funny when you have a look at it and, and they, it's like uh, the, some people just don't understand. You've got a, it's like my mum. I'm going through this process I'll go through today. You know, she's worried that she's going to run out of money, which is a typical case. I mean, she's, what, 85 years of age. But, you know, sometimes you've actually got to show them. And I think that's what's great about your system is that you can plan that out through that, through all that cash flow. Yeah. That makes a huge difference. Because, again, if, if, you, if you can um, show uh, effectively, and, and one of the ways that I would be doing it is probably if I go to my next slide, um, I won't worry about that. What I'd be doing is... Uh, for clients are looking at putting money into super. So they've got a good cash, they can get a tax deduction for it. Even if it's excessive, it's going to be added back to your accessible income for the current year. So you're not going to have to look at paying tax on it until May or June or whatever. So it's again, if you've seen my things and, I've, and we'll send some stuff out to you, but you know, my, my strategies are look for other family members and there's a good ATO ruling, which basically says, look, um, if, you, if they're employed effectively, you can put in whatever you want as a tax deductible contribution. You've got to watch out your excess, but there's no penalty taxes anymore. It's a simple add back, but you get a 15% tax offset. So you can spread the spread the love up to the older members of the family, provided it doesn't impact Social Security or Centrelink, you're in a pretty good position there. Um, one of the ones is if they're younger and they're going to put money in. So again, I had a chat with uh, someone who's got a lot of free cash flow. And they were just saying, well, you know, what are the caps? And I said, well, really, there are no caps because you start with a base of equity that you can put in. And then you can then use the commissioner's guidelines or you'll see when we have a look at this Stephen Keating, if you can show the commercial lender will lend on that basis, then that's what you, you'll utilise as your system. So that, you know, from that perspective, we want to put the cash in. Um, but, you know, if we're using the PCG 2016 slash five, and we're putting in, say, a couple of hundred thousand dollars. So let's say we've got plenty of cash. We're putting in $300,000 as uh, obviously a non-concessional contribution using the three you bring forward. We can then add another $300,000 as a related party loan. And the rates on that are pretty low at the moment. So that's $600,000 that effectively we can get in the system. In fact, 300 of it could be tax deductible. But the beauty about that is we've got the 600 sitting in the system. It's protected. But the other side of the coin is that that $300,000, which goes in the loan, we can draw it out because we don't know what our business is going to be like. So we might have a lot of cash now, but maybe in 18 months, two years, I need to have that. I need to have that flexibility in case my business needs that because we don't know what we don't know. Remember, expect the un unexpected, but at least I can use my... Um, my super fund as like a bank offset account. So that's now my bank. So I certainly encourage a lot of people there. Um, even if you're going through the, the process, you've got a property, if you can switch the property in, it's not a bad idea. Uh, and essentially um, look at look at utilising that so that you have got those younger members with a lot of cash, but they can pull it out at a later stage. Grant, can I just ask about that last slide? Like you spoke about putting 75 as a non-concessional 75 as later party loan. Is there a reason why you've got that as 50-50 or could you put in say 75 and a million bucks as a related party loan? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so what happens there is um, if you go, so there's, that's a really good question, Tim. So if you go down and have a look at PCG 2016 slash five, which was pre gnarly um, So the commissioner came out and said, look, this is your safe harbor. So your safe harbor, if you're in, and let's say you pick stocks or ASX 50 ETF or whatever, um, then it has to be 50 50, um, and then essentially you're off and running. But um, Steve Keating, when we discussed it with him, he basically said, Look, that's the safe harbor, but if you go out and effectively you find a, a better, sorry, you go out and find a better rate um, or a better LVR in the marketplace, then effectively you can um, utilize that one, which is great. Mm. Interesting. So be, okay. Yeah, so I'd, look, I'd, I'd be using that. But look, I've talked about non-concessional. You can do tax deductible. Um, even first home saver um, uh, inside super, you can make that a concessional contribution. So you just want to go through how you're using the protector because you came to me with it um, and tell me how you use it with your clients. Um, and then 
obviously we built it. We did our, you know, full due diligence going through all the cases and the one being Tia versus Nosbaum. Just want to go through exactly um, what you do, the process and, and what you're doing. You've got nine cases at the moment. Yeah, so th this is for a client where they have effectively in their own name um, an interest in a property or shares in a company or other assets. And if you try to transfer them, like if you're going to be a director of a company, what we call a risky person, you don't have any assets in your own name. So, you know, we will have clients to come to us um, because they've heard of what we do. And the first thing we do is, you know, a structure review, a tax review and a structure review. And we look at their asset liability position and we see that they've got these assets in their name. So if you can move a family house out from, you know, uh, to, you know, a, a risky person like a spouse that might not be working but they're stamp duty and that's a lot or if you've got investment properties you're going to trigger capital gains tax and then you have stamp duty as well so when you crunch the numbers it's hard to get those restructured in a safe way however um, using a combination of I suppose documents and, and approaches um, you can use a very you know clever and smart way of gifting the equity that you have in a property or in other assets to a safe trust, like a family protection trust, which is effectively your leading member trust. And that keeps your equity in those assets in your family bloodline. And that's a big thing. And when I talk to clients about, listen, you're working hard, you're working guts out to build up a business, but if your kids in their teens and in a relationship, you're in a car crash and you die, they inherit your money, and then the relationship fails. How do you feel about half of your family money being with another family who your son now or daughter now hates? And I said, no way. What can we do about it? And, and then we say, look, there's an option. And we explain the option. So we've put together, actually, you know, by listening to all your web events over the last 12 months, a 25-page letter of advice. Three pages cover the protector, but the rest cover absolutely everything else. And we're going to release this as an app probably be September, October now. Um, this, we've had a few other things now pushed to the front. But that way, accountants and planners can advise their clients on these things. But right now, like when it comes to the protector, um, look, for anyone that's coming to our uh, Activate Change 2021 next Friday, I'll give you this document so you can start using it. So that's a bit of a bonus there. Well, and, you know, Grant, you and I will talk through it in more detail. Yeah. But the steps are, as an accountant, first of all, I sign off on the a and L of which, whichever entity or individual is going to do this. Just to say, hey, listen, this person has got more than enough money to make this gift without, you know, without trying to avoid creditors. Then we do a deed of gift. So the individual or the uh, entity gifts to the you know, Family Protection Trust the equity. And then, okay, well, they can't actually give they're not giving the property across, but what they're doing is as a promissory note. So a promissory note is like a check. It's like promise to pay. So if I've got a million dollars equity in a property, I don't gift the property because that's effectively a transfer. But what I do is I gift a promissory note of a million bucks across. And then the uh, Family Protection Trust say, hey, okay, can you pay it? And we say, well, no, I can't. So there's a loan with the registered mortgage or PPSR, and that sets up the protection. Very clever, very smart way of doing things. Um, and the documents you've got uh, are fantastic, Grant. You know, we love using them. Yeah, well, thank you for introducing. Well, it's funny because when you went through, I said, oh, God, tick, 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 tick. I just didn't have the accountant's solvency certificate, which was one page, mm. so that was easy. Um, it's mm. quite funny because I've had a few people um, uh, come through other advisors and there, were, there was one person talking about a Vesti Trust, another one about this or that. So they've all got their little clever marketing names. We call it the protector. Uh, but they're charging, you know, anywhere between five to $10,000. And the beautiful thing about our system, um, we don't charge that for you. It's now given to your space for you to do that. And I think that's a big thing that I'm starting to see um, with a lot of people coming through, uh, a lot of accountants. They're still doing, and particularly financial planners as well, they're still doing and going down the track of, obviously uh, job keeper and all that, but they're now starting to branch out to the more the, what I call the high-end services. 
the stuff that they really know. I mean, they know their clients inside and out. And God forbid, after this job seeker and also job keeper and this, you, you've got a fantastic finger on the pulse. I think you're so lucky to do this that you're doing the protector, you know, and, and then now they're starting to do wills and enduring powers of attorney. I know you're going through that process with your clients and you're going to be talking about that, is it, on the uh, is it next Friday? Yeah, look, it's it's amazing. Uh, we'll, we'll go through that in a lot more detail at Act Day at Change 2021. So check out um, the Change GPS uh, website. I'm, I might give you a link to activate Change Grant so you can send that to everyone. Um, but yeah, I had a meeting with my largest client on Tuesday to sign off three of the protectors and um, just for three properties. It's a starting point. And the thanks and gratitude you get from them for doing this work is far in excess of any other work that we do for them. And yes, I'm not saying compliance is dead because it's not. And compliance is getting out of hand. It's getting worse. Just make certain you charge for it. But clients pay for it because they know they're going to do it. But they love paying for this sort of work because it makes them sleep better at night, which is just fantastic. So I say to all accounts out there, um, you know, you've got a lot of work, you've got a hell of a lot of work coming up over the next six to 12 months with all this. Make certain you get paid for it, but start to blend in your offerings for the asset protection, the estate planning, and the cash flow planning, you know, just to make certain that your clients are aware, um, you know, that they're not running a business that they really shouldn't be. Uh, the, this, these are the big ticket things, and that's why we've got so many, Grant, you've got so many on the session today. Um, and, you know, accounts, just get out and give it a crack. And, I'll be here to support you. No grant is as we'll keep doing these sessions, seeing so at the conference to do it for your clients. Yeah, it's been quite interesting. Again, there's been a, a lot of prevarication in the market. Uh, they made uh, changes to Section 102 AG in relation to testamentary trust, so you can't dump extra assets in there. But uh, you know, I build a SMSF death benefits trust, which is effectively a testamentary trust, but it's established by the trustee of the SMSF not the executor of the estate. So it's a completely different beast. It's almost like a child maintenance trust. So you put your property in there, which is obviously going to be cash or an asset or whatever, and it's going to be held there for the benefit of the beneficiary. So it's look for me, it's a much better uh, way of looking at things because you escape the family provisions claims at, at the end. So my thing is that where we've got clients uh, with quite substantial amounts, the typical thing of pushing them over testamentary trust is now really au okay. fait. It's not, it's not the done thing. You're better if it's in an SMSF, put it directly out through an SMSF death benefits trust, which is uh, essentially then it's up to the trustee and our SMSF will, you know, caters for all of that sort of stuff. So these are, again, um, you know, going back to what you're saying, Tim, is that accountants and also planners definitely need to have these other arms there that as we go down the, as we go down the track, um, if we do lose, um, and you know, you've said that those third of businesses who are starting to drop off, the good thing about it is if they do drop off um, and out of our system or they're no longer clients, you can actually use that time, those resources, and particularly if you're using our motor or something like that, you can build these amazing uh, strategies. I mean, how long does it take you to build a protector? Look... I've spent a lot of time on it. Um, using your system, I can knock one out for a client probably in about 15 minutes. I know. It's um, yeah. But I, I, can... I, go, I go through and do a title search on the property so I've got all the, you know, all the title details. Um, you know, like I'll do our, our advice first of all. And, and part of the advice, just so everyone is aware, is that we do cover off on clawback and things like that. And we say to the clients, listen, um, you know, there's there's a four year period of time. There's a four year period of time where people come back and can claw it off, claw it back. But if you do it at a time now when there are no other creditors and there's no one having a crack at you, you're not. In my opinion, and Grant, you're the lawyer, but in my opinion, you know, as an accountant, you're 99.9% .9 safe. Because how could someone in the future come back? They'd have to take you to court and come back and argue that you did something to defeat a creditor that only arose six, 12 months later. Like that's just, that's unheard of. I've never seen that happen. I know. Well, that's why it's better to be in, in one and that family protection trust using protector, because again, it's putting that moat around it, which is mm. essentially what we want to do. We want to put a moat around all our clients affairs and 
And the only people who can come in and out are obviously going to be the bloodline. Uh, and yeah. you know, lawyers, it, it depends to try and attack that. I mean, you're obviously, you're trying to challenge, you know, um, uh, case law and you need to have money uh, at the end of the day. If they're not, if they don't believe they're going to be at least 50% successful, they're just going to walk away because I can tell you after this COVID, there's going to be so much litigation uh, out there for lawyers. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens. Can I just ask on that slide, Grant? So you'd recommend you'd only have a will with a testamentary trust if a client had like an industry fund. So in other words, if they don't have a self-managed super fund, you can't obviously do the SMSF death benefits trust. So if it's a right. basic sort of client, industry fund, will testamentary trust tick. But if you've got an SMSF, 100% the SMSF death benefits trust. Absolutely. So um, remember, it, it can only be used for dependents, which include financial dependents, which is where we go with our family allowance. It's not tax dependence, it's cis dependence. So all your children are automatically included. So why would you transfer money for an adult child over into the estate? First yeah. off, you know how long it takes once someone dies, if you transfer it over, you've got to worry about probate. You've got to worry, it's going to take three to six months before you can even do anything. Whereas with an SMSF Death Benefits Trust, you can set it up within a day or two. Um, and then you're off and running. So it's a much better system that you can utilise and it's not clogged up with all the, obviously, the family provisions and succession laws as well. Yeah, brilliant. Um, anyway, I think we're at that time. Um, as I said, just watch out. Look, uh, there's going to be a big impact. And, and I, again, um, I don't know if anyone's ever seen Gary Boosie. He's a bit of a character. But pray for the best, prepare for the worst and expect the unexpected. Um, you know, we're in... We're in historical times. Uh, I, I feel lucky, and I'm sure you do, Tim, is that we've, we've been through a lot of bad times, um, you know, probably not professionally, but we've seen, you know, I, I saw the 91, 92 recession. I saw what happened there. Uh, we've seen share markets go up and down. You know, the, we've seen GFC. Uh, whereas a lot of the new people, a lot of my children in the marketplace coming for jobs, this is going to be a pretty tough decade for them, for those millennials. It's going to be extremely tough. And look, I, I honestly don't think that they, they are going to have that chance of getting into a home. But everyone's going to be impacted because, you know, there's a lot more properties out there for rent. And, you know, we just don't know what we don't know at the moment. And... What I'm trying to do, I was trying to look at things from a bigger picture and going from an international perspective, you know, in the, in the past, one country might be doing well and another one isn't. So therefore you look at the deficit, you look at the offshore lending and all of whatever, and then you kind of think, okay, well, yeah, our can, condition is going to go down. But this is worldwide. Everyone's printing money. Everyone's going into debt. So it's almost like no country has got an advantage over another country. So one school of thought to me is, well, okay, all this debt, yeah, I mean, we've got to pay it back, but every country's in the same spot. So it brings us all back to the same playing ground then, in a way. Now, I, I, I'm missing something, I'm sure, but I'm trying to understand, um, from that viewpoint, it mightn't be as bad. But from the other viewpoint, um, yeah, like, businesses do well when people get out there and they spend money and they acquire things and they invest in things. And... If the confidence is not there, so that does not happen, where does that leave us? Um, that's why my advice to everyone is cash up, keep charging for your work, make certain you don't do anything for free, look after your own business first of all, put your own you know, life jacket on first or your, your you know, oxygen mask on first before you help anybody else. Be positive with your clients. Um, and look, there's a lot of rubbish that's being said out there as well. We'll stick to people like Grant and myself and others that will keep coming up with positive ideas um, and let's keep supporting and helping each other. I think right now the accounting and planning communities have not got the um, pat on the back that we should have. I mean, all the doctors and nurses and people on the front lines, they get that and so they should. But we're in the front lines financially. We're helping people. Um, and I am frustrated that the accounting bodies in general seem to be getting absolutely nowhere no, with uh, the government. They come out there with all these statements about what they want, but nothing is happening. And all this, you know, it's just everything's done for big business. It's not done for small and mediums. And accountants out there, I'm frustrated. I'm sure you must be as well. Absolutely. 
go for the IPA, that's what I say. So uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for uh, attending. Um, I'll get this uh, video up and running and I'll send out, honestly, if you've got time over the weekend, look at that economic and fiscal update because Treasury spent a lot of time in there um, and they've said, look, this is what the rosy picture is, but this is what, you know, hellfire is going to look like. And they go through all our trading partners and the international movement of people. So if you have a look at universities have been relying on, on students, you know, they're giving a, the government's giving a boost there. Um, but the international trade in terms of uh, goods and services in particular, um, you know, like clothing and all that, that's still going on. It seems to be doing extremely well. So uh, COVID is, we'll look back on COVID and we'll see it's a tectonic shift um, in the way we work and do business. Um, we're right in the middle of it. And look, it's exciting times because it's certainly shaking us all over, <laughs> out of our trees. And I, I'm sure we're, we're all doing those 100 hour weeks. But anyway, it's uh, Grant Abbott and also Tim. Thank you very much for turning up today. Thanks, Grant. Thanks, everyone. See you all later. Okay. Bye.